One of the first entries on Yuhu was building the Knight Abominant from the Chaos Knight's army set. And in this set, we still have the two armagers, which will also have their own unique creation. We took the time to go through the building, sculpting, painting, and the atmosphere that went into the knight. And in this episode, we are going to create a unique armager with the same treatment. So it's time to get into the story of this armager's creation. With this armager, I want the build to be fully melee. And with that, I want to capture the frantic berserk nature of ripping things apart. And as we won't be using the standard monopose of the armager, we're going to need to make some changes. First, we will cut out the waist and the leg pieces. Glue the waist together. And now we need to break their legs at the knee joints. To do this, we'll use a sharp knife to score the joints and then slowly break the piece into two. With both sides cut, I'll then glue the pieces together and we should be left with two thighs and two shin parts. With the legs now glued and set, there will need to be a little bit of a cleanup required. Using a sharp knife, I will run this along the old joint and clear out any plastic frays. This is done on both sides that were just cut previously. Once it's cleaned up, I'll use Tamiya glue to clear any shavings and to smooth the area. Now we are left with the legs separated, which will help with the posing for the overall style. Next is dealing with the waist. Because the hip joints are already angled and keyed, I'll remove the key slot and cut the right hip joint so I can rotate its angle. With the hips now ready, we can start to glue on the legs. Let's start with the right leg. And to begin, we will angle the thigh higher, ready for the pose that I want to capture. For the left thigh, this will be angled downwards. In order to do that, I'll use the rotary tool to carve the hip joint down and to get the correct angle. The next part is dealing with the torso. Just like the knight, I do not like the waist sitting right into the torso. This gives no range of motion. So we will add a waist extender and this will give us that extra space. For the pose, I wanted to catch the armager as if it's just leapt forward and it's now searching for its next victim. And with the leap, I want it as if it's just landed on a vertical rock. So, in order to get the correct angle on the legs, it's going to need a lot of changing on the shin portion. Or, we can make some extra leg joints. These extra joints will connect between the original thigh and the shin. To attach the extensions, we will grind out the keyed groove and then super glue the piece onto the thigh. The next part is connecting the shin onto the extender. In order to do this, we will pin both the shin and the extension ready to be glued to each other. So, using the rotary tool and some paper clips, I'll drill the hole, fill it with some super glue, and insert the paper clip. The next part is attaching the torso. Because we are gluing directly onto the waist extender, we will use super glue to fix the two pieces together. Again, posing the torso to match the dynamics of the overall movement. With the overall body now done, the next part is working on the feet and the connections onto the base. As you can now see, the base is already designed, allowing us to get the right angle. So, testing multiple positions as to which way round the ankles should face, and with the solution figured out, the next part is to work on the toes. Most of the toes will be just left as they are, simply because they work with the pose. But there are a few toes which will need to be modified so they aren't just floating in midair. Again, for this model, we're going to go with an all melee approach. I didn't want to use the chainsaws, so instead I chose to go with the dual power claw. This way I can capture the more feral style considering the pose. So, grab the sprues, cut out the pieces, and glue the hands together. The same approach will be done for the upper part and the connection points. Now that we have the entire arm for both sides, we can now attach them to the model and start to pose them in order to match with the current pose. When I finally got the correct angle, I'll glue the piece in and use Tamiya on the joints to fuse them together. 
The last part is adding the claws. And for it, I wanted the talons to be opened wide. So these will be glued on in that fashion. The same process is followed for the opposite arm. The next major part is the head. For this armature, we will use the bone raptor style head. Again, this is going to be reposed. So using a sharp knife, I will score around the bottom jaw and get a clean removal of the lower jaw. With the part separated, now we can start the re-sculpting. Using a rotary tool, I'll carve out the upper jaw joint, ensuring I don't carve too deeply into the skull. A quick knife cleanup, and now we can repose the jaw. Now that we have the overall body completed, there are just a few parts left to do. Here we will get rid of any obvious mold lines and attach the smaller chains and exhausts. Now the armature is starting to look really menacing, but there are still a few bits missing here. For some extra touches, we'll be attaching some extra chains around each arm. To start, I'll add a small dot of superglue onto the model, use a toothpick to hook the first chain link, and then begin to lay the chain through the glue. Once the glue sets, we can now start to wrap the chain around the arm. And this process is repeated on both arms. So with that said, let's roll a quick montage. With the chains now done, I couldn't help but feel as if there was a piece still missing from this model, especially with the pose. Everything just seems very front heavy. You all probably know what's missing, but Arthur, what do we need? Oh, it needs a tail. So let's add a tail. Judging how the abominance tail is attached, we will follow the same style. To start, we'll need to remove the handlebar and fill the vents on the back to get a smooth area. Once the area is ready, we will glue the piece into place with super glue. Huh, strange. This armature is actually starting to look like a robotic dinosaur. With the tail now attached, all we need to do is prime and we're ready to start the painting process. Uh, Arthur, th that, that's the wrong scene. What you talking about, boy? The episode, it isn't over just yet. You still need to paint the model. But it's been you has been breaking those episodes into two. Why did I gotta do all the hard work around here? Arthur, just follow the script. God damn it, I ain't got time for this. Well, I'll be a son of a gun. To start the painting, we will begin by getting the skeletal frame painted first. So, we will base the entire frame in lead belcher. To do this, I'll use an airbrush and apply several coats. With the base color now on, we will then coat the entire frame in streaking grime, again through the airbrush. Now a word of warning here, if you're going to use this through the airbrush, then you need to make sure that the space is well ventilated and you are wearing a good quality respirator. You do not want to be breathing in any of these paints we're about to be using. Once the model is coated, use mineral spirits and a Q-tip to clean the majority off the model. This will give the frame some depth in the shadows. And a quick note, you don't need to be very careful here. Just work on removing the highest parts. 
The next part is now adding the rust detail. Thought there wasn't going to be any rust. What do you think this is? The Clean Society? For this part, we will again use the airbrush and apply AK Interactive's Dark Rust Deposits. This will be applied to all the recesses and joints with a little overspray on the flatter areas. Once it's dry, we will again start another reduction process. Using mineral spirit and a toothbrush, we will once again work on removing the majority of the dark rusts. So, saturate the toothbrush in the spirits and then first strike the model in one direction. This will start the reduction process. Once the spirits evaporate, you can then start to buff the remaining rust deposits into the base colour. The next step is back into the booth to use light rust deposits and apply this into the deepest recesses and joint connections. When it's dried, we will take the toothbrush without the spirits this time and start striking again in the same direction as before. This will start to blend into the dark rusts and the streaking grime that's been put down underneath. The reasons I prefer to work with these rust products is they work great with the reductive work style which I adopt throughout all of my paintings. A lot of the time we are thinking of putting the paint down in order to build up the areas of interest or detail. But with some areas Removing the paint is far superior in obtaining a more realistic and dynamic range. Sure, you can instead opt to put the paint down manually and layer it up to get that detail, but you will struggle in obtaining the unnatural streaking and partial blending in a non-uniformed pattern. Even when we try, it's very difficult to create a non-uniformed pattern and it's a tricky mindset to wrap the mind around to put paint down only to remove it. With the rust colouring now put down, let's start on working on bringing that steel colour back through. For this, we'll be moving on to the wax metallics. Using AK Interactive's True Metal Iron, we will apply this onto a tissue and begin to work the paint into a long, bristled brush. The motion we will work is similar to dry brushing. However, Unlike dry brushing, we need to work more of the paint off the brush first, and then we are buffing the paint onto the model. For this, we will again strike the model in the same direction as before, down the model. The reason we are using these paints instead of acrylics is, this paint is very pigment heavy and very easy to apply. The paint is very sensitive to texture and will apply to any surface with ease. Another great thing is, with this paint's nature to apply easily to any textures, we're going to get some random spots of smaller highlights on the flatter surfaces. This will also simulate more texture. For the final highlight, we will use AK Interactive's True Metal Steel, and this will be used for the sharpest edges. Again, following the same method as before. Work the paint into the brush, clean the most off, and buff the paint on with a light touch. Currently, this is what the frame is now looking like. Next, we'll add some quick colouring to the pistons, adding mecha oil stains into the areas to simulate oil. Another detail we'll add is for the torso, taking vermilion and watering this down four to one. Four parts water, one part paint. With this thinned mixture, we will place this into all of the torso pipes and cabling to emulate a subtle glow inside. Because this mixture is very watery, don't be afraid of any paint that runs wild. Simply use a Q-tip with some water and clean the area. This may take several coats when getting closer to the center of the torso. For the skull, this will be a base coat of orange ochre and then a highlight on one side of pale sands. With the skull based, we will wash with seraphim sepia. 
Firstly, in a uniformed wash, and then going back in with a clean wet brush and cleaning the highest points. When doing this, you'll need to work quickly. Citadel washes will cause stains if you attempt to move or disturb the paint that's partially dry. To finish, we will dry brush pale sands over the highest areas to catch those raised edges. And then for the eyes, we'll use Moot Green through the airbrush to create a small OSL effect. Now it's time to start working on the armor panels. The first coat will be Vallejo Field Blue. This will be used to coat all of the armor panels. The next color will be Orange Ochre. This will be focused on the flatter areas. Here we are going to maintain the previous color visible in the recesses and the shadows. The next color is then Pale Sands. This is for the highest spot where the light will touch. Again, keep the previous colors in the recesses and allow for the ochre to be visible on the lesser areas where the light wouldn't entirely touch. For the shoulders, we'll put down the Fiston Red. Again, keep the field blue in the lower recesses. Next, we'll use Vermilion for the higher areas to simulate the light. And now comes the fun part. All the pieces we just used will be coated in AK Interactive streaking rusts. Give each armor panel a good coating and allow this to dry for a few minutes. Now that it's dry, we will saturate the area in white spirits. Ensure the whole area is coated and then stroke the armor panel with a weathering brush in one solid direction. Give it a few seconds for the spirit to react with the enamel and then begin to add more spirits on top. This will cause a reaction and drag the pigment down the scratch marks we have just done with the weathering brush. Again, going between the weathering brush and resaturating the panel until we have reached the right amount of streaking that we want. Because some of the panels are smaller than the knights, we will use a brush saturated in spirits to get a more controlled removal of certain streaks. This process is repeated on every panel. Once we are happy with the end result, we will varnish the area ready for the next steps. Give the varnish 24 hours to dry naturally, or if you're impatient like myself, a hairdryer will be your best friend. The next step is to increase some of the streaks. So taking streaking rusts again and a brush, we will add streaks in a more concentrated area. Do not worry about being neat we're going to clean them up once this is dried with spirits. With the brush, we are now going to clean the edges of the streaks that we have just put down. When doing this, we are running the brush tip along the edge and slowly bringing it into the center of the streak at the bottom. 
With the streaking done, we will now start to deal with the metallics. And for the top carapace, we will base coat the pipes and chains in AK Interactive's True Metal Iron. For the front trim, we will be going for a brass effect. In achieving this, we are going to be blending two metallics for the base coat. To start, we are going to be using AK Interactive's copper, and this will be used in the areas of the trim that's in the shadows and recesses. For the upper parts, we will use AK Interactive's True Metal Brass. Because these are wax paints, they do blend very well with each other, and they also react well when introduced to oils, which we'll be adding later. This process is repeated on all the trim on the armor. Brass on the highlight spots, and copper in the shadows and darker spots. Next for the trim, we're going to be using oils. To start, we're going to use Starship Filth, which will be coated on all of the steel. Let it quickly dry, and then wipe the colouring off. The next colour will be for the brass trim. Using Aptalung 502 Copper Oxide Blue Patina, this is thinned down in a 2 to 1 mix ratio. Two parts spirits, one part oils. Apply this thin mixture to all of the rivets and tight spots. Wait a few minutes for this to dry, and then take a dry Q-tip and start to wipe the oils down the trim. The colour will start to smear, but also it will start to blend into the wax undercoat. This process may need to be repeated multiple times on all of the armour panels. The next part is to work on the highlights. And for this, we'll take AK Interactive's True Metal Gold and begin the same buffing process as we did on the frame. Load up the brush, remove most of the paint and then lightly buff the trim with the gold. Now that we have finished with the trim, we will work on getting the centre stone painted. To begin this, we will put a base coat of Rhinox Hide and allow this layer to dry. The next colour will be Vallejo Vermilion, and thin this mixture to a 4 to 1 mix. 4 parts water, 1 part paint. This will mix the paint down into a glaze consistency. Once we have the correct amount loaded onto the brush, we will begin to layer up on top of the Rhinox Hide. To do the glazing, I will pull the paint into one direction and ending at the point where I want the paint pigment to be the most concentrated. Once this layer is down, it's time to wait for this to dry. You can wait for this to dry naturally, or grab the hairdryer. We don't want you falling asleep watching paint dry. We will repeat this process multiple times until we get the correct gradient to red. Once we are happy with the red side, we will then make a glaze of the Rhinox hide in the same manner. Load up the brush and then begin to pull the thin layer from the centre back into the dark side. Again, this will need a few layers.
When we finally have our gradient, we will then take ivory and add two small dots to one top corner, and then a guided outline on the opposite bottom corner to simulate the light bending through the gemstone. Perfect. The next part is to really tone down the iron pipes and chains on the top carapace. Here we will use dirty down and place a thin coating over the areas. Give it a few minutes to dry and then take a wet q-tip and remove the dirty down. This will leave the recesses. This process is repeated several times to get the right intensity that we are after. Now that the model is coming to a close end, we will now add the extra bits to really bring this model together. First, we'll deal with the skeleton frame. Using the same red as we put down on the wash, we will use the airbrush and add a more concentrated glow into the center part of the torso and the vents. Next, we'll use Vallejo yellow, and this will be isolated into the center areas of the previous layer that we've just put down. This will simulate the heat emanating from this source. Now it's time to start adding the gore. To do this, I want to add blood and sinew draping between both claws, as if he's just rampaged through a whole unit. To do this, we'll be using Uhu glue and mixing in blood for the blood god onto a piece of paper. Get the two mediums mixed together and then take two toothpicks and start to string the gloopy glue along the claws and spikes. The glue will start to stick onto the sharp edges. When the glue has a grip, then it's time to slowly pull the glue and allowing it to stretch and leave long strings along the model. The key is to be as random as possible and surprisingly this is very difficult in doing. Once we have the majority on the model, we'll take just clear Uhu glue and repeat the process once again. The next part is to add the blood splattering. Load up the brush and then start to flick lightly along each claw. Some of the splats will land on the midsection but the concentration will land onto the claws and this will simulate the center part where the splattering has originated from. For the base we'll start to color in the water using Vallejo blue and coat the entire flooring. Next, we'll use black brown for the stones, and this will be used along the edge of the stone where it's meeting the water. For the rocks, we'll add a quick simple gradient from Eschen Grey through to Warp Fiend Grey. The next part is using paint mixed to a wash consistency. Taking a bright red, a green, and a blue, we'll add random streaks across all of the stone and let this set in and let it freely mix along the rocks. Just make sure there are some clear streaks of the color. When it's dry, we will now dry brush Eshing Grey over the top and then do a final highlight dry brush of Dawnstone. 
To get the water effects, we will use effect water and then start to push the mixture into place. First with the brush, and then use an airbrush to get the waves and effects around the bodies. Finally, we will be using some dried moss to act as vines wrapping around the bodies, blending them into the background. A pair of tweezers and a toothpick will get this job done. From here, all that's left to do is paint the trim, let everything dry, and then we are left with this.